No way, Mr. Wickham. I'm author Elizabeth Ann West, and this is Chapter 4 of For the Love of a Bennett. Unlike other chapter readings, where it might be a work in progress, this book is already published. You can find For the Love of a Bennett on all major book vendors, including paperback and ebook on Amazon, and in ebook form on Apple's iBooks store, Barnes & Noble, Google Play, and Kobo. Convenient links are included in the description below. This is the last chapter before we hit the road. To Brighton, that is. Mother Bennett has thrown a grand fate, and of course, to send her daughters and the militia off. I did write Lydia very brazen in this scene, however, that does match with how forward she was when Jane and Elizabeth returned from London in the original Pride and Prejudice, about how much she cares that Wickham escaped the clutches of Mary King. Let's see what happens after Elizabeth goes downstairs after finishing the last of her packing. Chapter 4 Below the stairs, Longbourn proved quite busy as not only had the Forsters and Phillips arrived, but so had a few officers from the regiment. To Elizabeth's dismay, as she and Jane reached the last step, they stood before none other than Mr. Wickham, offering them a dazzling smile. Lydia tugged on his arm before a proper greeting could be exchanged, sparing Elizabeth the need to play falsely. "'Come this way,' she pleaded. "'We're playing charades until dinner is announced.' She giggled, and Mr. Wickham gave Jane and Elizabeth a small bow before disappearing into the din. As Elizabeth took the last step, her sister Jane blocked her. "'I am well,' Elizabeth said, as her agitation with the man had mostly passed. Any agitations of partiality had long left her sensibilities after she had returned from Kent and could view Mr. Wickham's behavior in a new light. Now she only struggled to keep her agitation of knowing Mr. Wickham was a complete cad under good regulation. Is this why you insisted on going with Lydia? A voice behind them asked, and the two girls turned around to see their papa. They both expected him to comment on Lydia's behavior, but instead the man of two score and five thought he had seen something else. I didn't take you to chase a redcoat, Lizzie, he commented as he glided past them to make his presence known to their guests. Elizabeth grew angry, and Jane placed a reassuring hand on her forearm. You know how Papa loves to tease us for our bows, she warned. He is not my bow, she, Elizabeth said under her breath as the laughter and shouts from the drawing room drifted into the foyer. If Elizabeth knew her mother, she had likely told the kitchens to delay supper and this gave her an idea. You go on without me. I'll be right there. Lizzie, Jane warned, thinking her sister's absence would prove to their father he was correct in his estimation that he had somehow unsettled his favorite daughter. But Elizabeth dashed off through the back hall, past the dining room, and into the kitchens. Cook was yelling commands at a poor kitchen maid cutting pastry with, for one of the later courses and spied Lizzie near the door. She winked at the bedded daughter that often stole out the back through her kitchens for a daily ramble, snagging any baked goods conveniently left out for her perusal. Miss Lizzie, the cook addressed the young miss of the household. The plans to delay dinner have changed. My mother sent me, Elizabeth started, and to her satisfaction, she had predicted the even correctly. Changed? I do not know why I tolerate such treatment. You there, boy, move that roast back onto the fire. Hurry, girl, stop your tears. The pies won't cut themselves. The cook began yelling at the lowest servants in the household out of frustration. Elizabeth offered the young kitchen maid a look of sympathy when the tear-streaked face met hers as she backed away to the door. So how long until the announcement? Elizabeth asked gingerly, not wishing to bring the cook's ire down upon herself. Tell them, Mrs. I shall have the table set before the quarter hour, cook bellowed. She began tasting things and giving more orders to the staff. Elizabeth winced as she left the kitchen, feeling slightly guilty that her mother might become very cross when she later learned that Elizabeth had interfered with her carefully planned dinner. But if such a feat spared even 20 minutes in the drawing room and hastened the end of the evening that much sooner, Elizabeth could spare the consequences. After all, by the time her mother could find time to scold her, Elizabeth would be gone on her way to the Forsters. When Elizabeth rejoined the drawing room, she nodded at Jane, who gasped in shock. She had not believed Elizabeth when she had first warned of their mother's antics to prolong their time with their odious cousin, Mr. Collins, specifically Elizabeth's time with Mr. Collins. But Jane always did see the best in people, 
and even though she would now believe her sister, she would not still not see anything but the best and not mercenary intentions in their mother. Sometimes Elizabeth wished she could be more like Jane and see such positivity in others as she sighed and leaned against the doorway. Lieutenant Denny noticed Elizabeth standing and gallantly stood up to offer his seat on the sofa next to Colonel Forster. On the other side of Colonel Forster, Lydia sat cheering Mr. Wickham for his performance of a particular charade that alternated between a giant enormous beast of unknown origin and a tiny squeaking annoyance. Utterly bored with Mr. Wickham's presence in the house, Elizabeth guessed it right away. Aesop's the lion and the wolf mouse. All activity stopped, as Elizabeth had guessed correctly. Awkwardly, Mr. Wickham complimented Elizabeth on her cleverness. Bravo, Miss Elizabeth. What, what a marvelously swift guest. Uh, guess I should expect nothing less from such an intelligent lady as yourself, he said, bowing. Lydia stood up and crossed her arms over her chest, blocking her sister from Mr. Wickham's view. You ruined all the fun, she scolded, and then turned around to address the actor himself. Mr. Wickham, I think you are infinitely more agreeable as a mighty lion, she said, batting her eyelashes as she th sought his attention. Unfortunately, Mr. Wickham was taller and looking beyond her to read Miss Elizabeth's face for her reaction to his compliment. Saving Elizabeth from having to respond, Hill entered the drawing room to signal to Mrs. Bennet that dinner was ready. Are, are you certain? My, that is so well of cook. Mrs. Bennet recovered herself recovered, fanning herself. She addressed the Forsters. It must be so difficult to travel as much as you do. She had living house to house. You never can rely on good help, but we are blessed with a very punctual cook. I had told her I wanted dinner served not a minute past six, and there, you see, the bells are yet to chime, Mrs. Bennet boasted. We do quite well to have her proficiency in the army, Colonel Art Forster said, just as the clock began to strike the hour. The assembled party began to partner off with Mr. Bennett escorting Mrs. Bennett, followed by the Colonel and his wife, the Phillipses, and in absence of Captain Hark Carter, Lieutenant Denny held the prestige of escorting Miss Bennett. I believe I am to be your escort, Lieutenant Wickham gallantly offered his armed Elizabeth as she rolled her eyes. Mr. Chamberlain and Mr. Pratt escorted Mary and Kitty, respectively, and Lydia, without an escort, cheekily took Mr. Wickham's other arm. Since we're both going to Brighton, you shall have to just sit between us, Mr. Wickham, Lydia pronounced as her delaying their entry into the dining room caused those exact seats to be all that was left. Thankfully, Elizabeth would sit next to her father at the head of the table, with Mr. Wickham next to her and Uncle Phillips across from her next to Jane and Lieutenant Denny. For social evenings, the Great Hall of Longbourn was refashioned as an elegant dining room, capable of seating twenty comfortably, four and twenty if pressed. The walls were hung with portraits of long-dead Bennets, and the room was lit by two modest chandeliers that more fashionable homes would have updated away from their rustic style. Mrs. Bennet prided herself on a local reputation of putting on a good spread for her guests, and the farewell dinner for, her, for two of her daughters and the militia was no exception. The table was set with the family's finest china, and four candelabras separated the long table proportionately so that the room felt well lit. A roasted duck, stuffed with apples and onions, was the centerpiece of the table, surrounded by platters of fricasseed vegetables and game meat. Elizabeth managed to get through the first course without saying a word to Mr. Wickham. During the second course, highlighting a variety of mince pies and mottled veal and burnt cream, her father brought up how sad he was to lose Elizabeth so soon after her return. All of this travel back and forth disturbs my humble living. I think I should never stand it. Lizzie, you have only just unpacked your things that you are filling your trunks once more. Such a nuisance, Mr. Bennett complained. But I understood Miss Bennett and Miss Elizabeth were late to London, not too far a distance, I don't think, Mr. Wickham commented. My Jane remained in London, but Lizzie traveled further on, spending three weeks with her cousin in Kent, an estate called Rosings, I believe. Mr. Bennett watched with greater intrigue as Mr. Wickham <coughs> choked <coughs> on his mince pie, and Lydia fussed over his person. Once he recovered, Mr. Wickham was not clever enough to realize Mr. Bennett set up conversations only for his own amusement. "'And how did you pass your time at Rosings? Very pleasantly, I hope?' Mr. Wickham asked, despite Lydia's attempts to speak to him about the gowns she had packed for Brighton. "'Very well.' as I was pleased Mr. Darcy and his cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, were in residence visiting their aunt. 
We dined at Rosings a number of times, and I found the company, as well as the countryside in Kent, well to my liking, Elizabeth said, to both nettle her father and Mr. Wickham. She had all but lost her appetite, but conditioned herself to breathe and remember to be more like Jane. Her plan worked, as Mr. Wickham engaged Lydia for the next topic of conversation. This time, about card games they could all play in Brighton that were much the same they had been playing in Aunt Philip's parlor. Defiantly, Elizabeth served herself a slice of French pie, flavored with some of the last of the elderberry wine until the next year's crop was processed, an extravagance put on by her mother. Loading her fork with the sweetly filled pie brought a sour feeling to her stomach. Her family was not poor so much as mismanaged. Mr. Darcy had been completely correct that her father was complicit in her lower station. As though he could read her mind that she was thinking about Mr. Darcy, Mr. Wickham brought up the man again. How long did you say that Mr. Darcy was at Rosings? Elizabeth gulped. Nearly three weeks. She picked up her glass of wine and immediately regretted washing down the sweetness with more sweetness. And you saw him frequently? Her hand shook, nearly spilling her wine upon the tablecloth. Yes, almost every day. At this admission, her father ceased cutting his meat and looked pointedly at his daughter, but said nothing. Mr. Wickham, upon spying Mr. Bennet's behavior, tried to move the conversation away from such an intrusive slant. But he could only come up with a lame, lame observation of the two men not present for the dinner, and one of the acquaintance of only himself and Miss Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy's manners are very different from his cousin's. Waiting for her father to start a conversation with her Uncle Phillips to his left, Elizabeth finally answered low enough that only Mr. Wickham comprehended all of her words. Yes, very different, but I think Mr. Darcy improves on acquaintance. The entire table turned their attention to her mother and Aunt Phillips cackling at the other end of the table with Lieutenant Denny and Colonel Forster. The Colonel was closer in age to those two women than his poor young wife Harriet, who struggled to command the same respect of a married woman being so junior in the position. Colonel Forster lowered his voice and continued to relate more of his story that featured Lieutenant Denny prominently, guessing by the man's gestures and poor Denny's blush. But Elizabeth could not quite make out the details. When at last the servants cleared the dishes of the second course, the dining room became a cacophony of chaos. Desserts, brandy, and tea would be served in the drawing room after a brief separation of the sexes. Mr. Wickham patiently waited for Lydia to be engaged in teasing poor Chamberlain before he tried to ply Lizzie with, a, with an earful of poison against Mr. Darcy. Unfortunately, his words came out in a jumbled mess of nonsense, that even if Elizabeth had not recently read Mr. Darcy's letter itemizing Mr. Wickham's defects of character, she would not have been persuaded. You, who so well know my feelings towards Mr. Darcy, uh, will readily understand how, how sincerely I must rejoice that, that he's wise enough to assume even the appearance of what is right. His pride in that direction may be of service, if, if not to himself, to many others, for it must deter him from such foul misconduct as I have suffered by... Elizabeth ceased paying attention to the man's pointless jabber about Mr. Darcy, feeling no incentive to pay him even the respect of a guest in her home. She stared directly ahead until Mr. Wickham's mentioned Mr. Darcy's aunt in the match to Mr. Berg. The stab of jealousy that panged her heart finally made her look away from Mr. Wickham's ramblings directly into the bemused face of her father. She quickly remembered that Mr. Darcy had proposed to her. If such a match existed, she could scarcely believe that Mr. Darcy's pride and character could ever allow him to jilt such a young innocent as Mr. Berg. At this, Elizabeth changed her wince of emotional pain into a minxish smile, a transformation she had not meant for her father to witness. Peace, Mr. Wickham, you have monopolized my Lizzie long enough. You shall see her at your, le at your leisure, I'm sure, in Brighton, but for now I must insist upon her company, Mr. Bennet said, separating the two he had earlier in the evening believed to be a couple crossed in love. When Mr. Wickham obliged, Elizabeth allowed her father to escort her out of the room and, despite her anger with him over the last week since Lydia's invitation, thanked him for the rescue. "'Oh, do not thank me, child. I fear that you may know more about the man than I,' he ventured, and recognized Elizabeth's stony expression as one of great discretion. So he changed his tack. "'Go. Your mother and other sisters, I am sure, have much caterwauling and farewells to grace you and Lydia with, and I suspect the Colonel will not wish to tarry long.' Elizabeth nodded and left the men in the dining room as she joined the ladies in the drawing room. 
Her mother sat in high dungeon upon the sofa, already allowing tears of motherly desertion to flow freely down her cheeks. She was consoled by Aunt Phillips and Lydia, as Lydia and Mrs. Forster spoke animatedly by the fireplace. But from Mary, Kitty, and especially Jane, Elizabeth was embraced, wished well, and the sisters exchanged expressions of how much they would miss each other. Both Lydia and Elizabeth promised to write, but even Jane knew only one of her sisters was likely to be a reliable correspondent. The other would be far too busy retrimming her bonnets and recounting her brushes with officers to put pen to parchment. Thank you for listening. Let me know what you think down in the comments. If you do decide to support my writing by purchasing a book, thank you so very much. And please let me know down in the comments. I do respond to each and every one. Are you enjoying the chapter readings? Please consider liking this video and subscribing so you will not miss another chapter reading. Until next time.